A rabbi once told me that if Christianity were a little less Paulish, we might all be a little bit more Jewish. And I think he has a point. There's a lot of stuff we do and say in church which Jesus didn't actually talk about. So I often try to get back to what Jesus said rather than the theological workings of St Paul and of 2,000 years of Christians. And Mark 1 verse 15 is a really good starting point. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus' first sermon. But Jesus wasn't speaking English, of course, and he probably preached in Aramaic, not in Greek. And every word seems to have a hidden or varied meaning. I personally think that Peterson's translation in the message gets it very well. Time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. It's punchy. It's straight to the point. But what exactly is the point? The first thing Jesus seems to be saying is not that he's starting something new, but that it's all over. Time's up, he says. A lovely past perfect passive. The time has been fulfilled. And the word repent, which has meant everything down the ages, from do penance to get on your knees and feel miserable about yourself, just means change your mind about things. In other words, stop thinking and acting like you used to think and act. Get positive and welcome the good news. But still, what is the good news? What is Jesus's message? Protestants would, I think, point to sinners being justified by faith through the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Catholics would point to us being gradually sanctified by grace through the sacraments until we are recreated in the image and likeness of Christ. But what did Jesus who was neither a Catholic nor a Protestant, but was Jewish, mean by good news, the message. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus goes on to call four apostles, and then he does a great many healings and miracles. Luke's Gospel, after the temptations, Jesus proclaims good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed. And I do think it's always good to ask ourselves whether our proclamation of the gospel does all those things well? The answer is that it probably doesn't. You see, over 60 years of Christian faith and nearly 40 years of ministry, I have come to realise that none of us ever live up to the call of Jesus. The church doesn't, and the world doesn't, and we don't either. For me, Jesus is still as difficult to follow as he was 2,000 years ago, and it doesn't get any easier. Jesus tells us not only to love our enemies as if that wasn't bad enough, but he tells us not to resist the one who is evil. He tells us to give our cloak to the person who takes our tunic and to give to those who begs from us. He tells us to hate our own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even our own lives and to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. Now, of course, I can theologize and rationalize all of the above. And when I get to the pearly gates, I'll have a jolly good chance at arguing my case with Jesus. But I suspect he will just look at me in the eyes and love me and say, really? Go sell all you have and give to the poor and then come and follow me. So what then is Jesus's good news, especially when it's all so difficult? And not everyone will agree with me on this, I know, but I don't think the good news of Jesus is transactional. You do this and I will do this for you. I think the good news is just simply that God is with us, always with us, here, there and everywhere. The reign of God has come near and it now is, as we used to translate that rather beautiful past perfect Engiken in our Greek class. You see, I think the good news, and we so need to hear it, is that there is no place in our broken and sinful world and lives where God is not. Have a happy Lent.